Well, Jackie Cabasso was the executive director of Western States Legal Foundation, has been working for many, many years on anti-nuclear issues at all levels and all over the world. And she has some very good ideas on what some of the obstacles are to, to organizing in this country. Okay, thank, thank you, Joan. Um, I'm gonna switch the subject just a little bit, and I'm afraid that I'm gonna be addressing my remarks uh, mostly to my American colleagues, although I think that those of you who are visiting might find it interesting. I'm talking about obstacles to peace and disarmament. Um, Obstacles to effective organizing against nuclear weapons, missiles, and militarism in the U.S. as a critical factor in closing military bases. And the obstacles I'm going to talk about are single issues approaches, lack of education within and among social movements, and the role of funders and false allies in maintaining the status quo. So let me start out by putting this whole subject in a much bigger context. <laughs> This is a quote from Chalmers Johnson, who was a former Cold War hawk, later became a leading critic of US militarism. He said, quote, as distinct from other peoples, most Americans do not recognize or do not want to recognize that the US dominates the world through its military power. Due to government secrecy, our citizens are often ignorant of the fact that our garrisons encircle the planet. This vast network of American bases on every continent except Antarctica actually constitutes a new form of empire, an empire of bases with its own geography not likely to be taught in any high school geography class. Without grasping the dimensions of this globe-girdling base world, one can't begin to imagine the size and nature of our imperial aspirations or the degree to which a new kind of militarism is undermining our constitutional order. So that's the first thing that we have to remember. Most people in the peace movement aren't aware of that or don't think about it or don't want to deal with it. Certainly most people working on nuclear weapons don't want to deal with that reality. So secondly, as uh, our last speaker mentioned, um, STRATCOM, STRATCOM is one of 10 unified combatant commands that the United States military has created to essentially carve up the globe into zones for a control. There's the Northern Command, Africa Command, Central Command, European Command, Pacific Command, Southern Command, Special Operations Command, Joint Forces Command, Transportation Command, and these are all linked together by Strategic Command, which is still in charge of U.S. nuclear war planning. Okay, third dimension of this is not new. A 1993 Congressional Research Service study of the U.S. Navy's uh, Naval Historical Center records identified 234 instances in which the U.S. has used its armed forces abroad in situations of conflict or potential conflict or for other than normal peacetime purposes between 1798 and 1993. And the author noted, this list does not include covert actions or numerous instances in which U.S. forces have been stationed abroad since World War II in occupation forces or for participation in mutual security organizations like NATO, base agreements or routine military assistance or training operations. In a 2006 review of this study and two other studies of U.S. military interventions, journalist Garth Smith found that, quote, in our country's 230 years of existence, there have only been 31 years in which U.S. troops were not actively engaged in significant armed adventures on foreign shores. He concluded, the arithmetic is daunting. Over the long course of U.S. history, fewer than 14% of America's days have been marked by peace. The defining characteristic of our nation's foreign policy for 86% of our existence would appear to be a bellicose penchant for military intervention. As of 2006, there were 192 member states in the United Nations, and over the past two centuries, the U.S. has attacked, invaded, policed, overthrown, or occupied 62 of them. And then finally, in case your eyes are not getting glazed over enough, um, the U.S. spends nearly as much um, as the rest of the world's countries combined on its military, accounting for 41% of the global total in 2011. 
U.S. military spending in 2011 was nearly five times more than the next biggest spender, that was China, almost 10 times that of Russia. Last year, the U.S. spent $711 billion on its military, twice as much as the next 14 countries combined. And in 2008, the U.S. spent an estimated $52.4 billion on nuclear weapons and associated costs alone. So, that's the big context. So now I'm going to talk about the problem of single issue organizing. Um, there is a network in the United States of anti-nuclear groups located mostly at different facilities, which only deals with Department of Energy funded programs, which means warheads. So they only campaign against nuclear warheads. They do not address delivery systems. If you don't address, which are funded by the Department of Defense, if you don't study and take on delivery systems, then you also aren't going to be concerned about missile defense, so-called missile defense, which actually is part of an offensive U.S. nuclear war fighting configuration. This is a problem, and if you're not thinking about missiles and missile defense, you're also not involving yourself in wars or threats of wars. It's very problematic, and it's a, it's a stuck way of thinking that started in the 1980s when groups were discovering local contamination at their facilities, but they're stuck there for the most part. Second thing is a lack of education within and among our social movements and forgetting our own history. So for those who, some of you I know, were very involved in anti-nuclear anti weapons work in the 1980s. In the 1980s, there was a palpable fear of a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. And the anti-nuclear movement was dominant in the US and Western Europe and many other parts of the world. It was, I think, a bigger issue even than climate change now in people's minds. And what happened when the Cold War ended very suddenly, the Soviet Union disappeared, people collectively around the world like breathed a sigh of relief. Oh, we didn't have a nuclear war. And they went on to work on other issues because they figured, well, nuclear weapons are going to take care of themselves. There are lots of other things for us to work on. Well, those of us who were looking at our local facilities, in our case, the Livermore Nuclear Weapons Laboratory, discovered that within a very short period of time, two or three years, new justifications had been created to propel the nuclear enterprise forward. And the, after a few years of funding dropping off, it started to climb again. And now, nuclear spending on nuclear warhead-related programs alone, I want to be careful to say that, because it's a small percentage of the nuclear weapons spending, $7.6 billion, is the highest ever in inflation adjusted dollars, higher than the Cold War years, okay? Um, well, in 2002, in the run-up to the uh, Iraq War, uh, we were involved in the formation of United for Peace and Justice. We were working because my organization does not work for nuclear disarmament in a vacuum. We work out of commitments to nonviolence and international law, so of course we were opposed to that war. And when we went into the uh, when we went into the first National Assembly of United Peace and Justice with a proposal that nuclear abolition be one of the priorities. Why? Because one of the justifications for the war was Saddam Hussein's nuclear weapons program, which did not exist and which anybody who read the weapons inspectors reports knew. So we were met with kind of puzzlement for the most part, like, huh? And a few nuclear disarmament, that's the Bush agenda. And, and people did not know that the U.S. actually had drawn up contingency plans for battlefield use of nuclear weapons in Iraq in 2003. So it was a process that began a long process of education within the anti-war movement about why nuclear weapons are important, why they are central to anti-militarism, peace, and justice work. 
And it's an ongoing struggle. It's been, I've been very involved with it. I chair the UFPJ Nuclear Disarmament and Redefining Security Working Group, because those two go hand in hand. And we are the only formation in the United States that I know of that is actively working on, on opposing routine test launches of intercontinental ballistic missiles from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, which the other groups, that most other groups that work on nuclear weapons issues don't seem to think are worth paying attention to. Um, now let me talk about the question of funders and false allies. And this is probably the most controversial thing I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway because I think it needs to be said. Um, when the Cold War ended, most of the, many of the organizations around the country, well, many groups went on to work on other issues, other important issues. Um, those that continued to work on nuclear weapons, many of them relocated their headquarters to Washington, D.C. Many of them went into the Clinton administration um, because of, they had access, it's what I call the access disease. And the funding, the funding dropped off for work in the field generally, but the funders kind of consolidated themselves and started putting forward their own program and their own agenda, which is very much what the situation is now. In the mid-1990s, we ran into our first round of this recurring pattern of arms control treaty negotiations being turned into anti-disarmament measures. I'm talking about the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and the deal that the Clinton administration made with the weapons laboratories and the Hawks in the Senate to functionally replace full-scale underground nuclear testing with laboratory tests and computer simulations, which actually is what enabled the modernization programs which began then. They're not new. Fast forward now. Uh, well, and bringing this information into Washington, D.C. and trying to lobby was absolutely rejected by the arms control groups, uh, by the funders. This is dangerous. You're undermining the, te the test ban treaty. Well, let me tell you a real life story. We tried desperately to bring this information and say we support a comprehensive test ban treaty because it means something, but with these conditions attached to it, it will become meaningless. And a couple of years after we lost that one and um, Clinton sent the test ban treaty to the Senate for ratification and they refused to ratify it anyway because the lab directors changed their stories, but that's a whole other story. Um, I was contacted by the head of the Office of Management and Budget, responsible for drawing up the nuclear weapons budget. And I knew him from some previous meetings. He was very agitated. He closed the door. He said, what the hell is going on? Last September, I was preparing the budget, and I was in a position to recommend deep cuts in, in funding for the nuclear weapons laboratories. And I was told by, and he named names, and some of you know who these people are, it's our arms control friends in Washington, that there was no opposition out there. Now this is a real life example of how powerful grassroots opposition to that deal could have made a difference, but it wasn't allowed. Now fast forward to the New START Treaty, an even more egregious case in some ways. Ways. Um, the, as you know, President, Clinton, President Obama, could be President Clinton, same difference, um, promised the Senate uh, over $200 billion for modernization of the nuclear warheads, the delivery systems, and the production facilities by 2020. Um, that was one of the conditions that the Senate insisted on. And what we had was the drumbeat from the arms control experts. Call your senator, tell them to ratify the START Treaty. The START Treaty will, we will be able to maintain our nuclear deterrent, etc., etc. And specifically, a message was sent by the funders. Um, it would be a very bad mistake to frame this in any press statements as a step toward the elimination of nuclear weapons. And this should not be about going to zero nuclear weapons. I met with the senior staff people of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee from both parties 
with the mayor of Hiroshima. With the mayor of Hiroshima, and they told him the same thing. Um, you had a... Did you say the partners? It's the consortium that's headed by Plasters. Um Where is this great quote? Ah, Senator Bob Corcoran, Republican senator from Tennessee, who supported START, and in whose district the new uranium processing facility is located, said, I am proud that as a result of ratification, we have been successful in securing commitments from the administration on modernization of our nuclear arsenal and support of our missile defense programs. Two things that would not have happened otherwise. In fact, thanks in part to the contributions my staff and I have been able to make, the New START Treaty could easily be called the Nuclear Modernization and Missile Defense Act of 2010. All right? Now, as we're in the... Um, Defense Authorization Bill negotiations in the Congress, a bunch of Republicans in the House are demanding an even higher price for START and are saying uh, that they will stop START implementation unless more money is pledged and, and many other hideous conditions including, get this one, commissioning a study on redeploying U.S. nuclear weapons to South Korea. Um, what I forgot to say most importantly was that, that same, the message with START was the same. Do not talk about, well, I, I read you that. And that was, again, my organization, which was willing to question it and say, we put out a, an information brief actually called uh, START, One Small Step for Arms Control, One Giant Leap Backward for Disarmament, question mark. And we were like pariahs, okay? Now, that start is unraveling, that the Russians are threatening to withdraw, exactly because of the conditions that were attached by the Senate, and which are now trying to be reinforced by the House. We have the Arms Control Association putting out, we've, don't hold New START hostage to budget battles. With no, don't, don't hold New START hostage to budget battles. No sense of irony whatsoever. What was the dynamic going on? The dynamic going on was because everything is concentrated in Washington, because they have access, because funding is directed there with a message. There's very little grassroots out there. There certainly isn't a lot of grassroots leadership. Everybody, people of really good will and intention look up to these experts to tell them what they should do, and so they all run to contact their senator, ratify new start, don't say anything about disarmament. And so the effect is, we actually have no voice for abolition of we nuclear weapons in the United States at this time. That's the fact. And we have to do something about that. And the way we have to do something about that is by, I believe, putting our understanding of nuclear weapons. And by the way, let me say one more thing. Okay. This has real consequences, okay? Um, these obstacles. The US and Russia are poised to enter into a serious new Cold War type arms race because of a number of factors. The expansion of NATO, the European missile defense system, which NATO is gonna announce the activation of tomorrow. Um, the potential of countries like Georgia joining NATO. The modernization, which was talked about, by the way, this B61 modification would actually have a selectable yield and a new tail kit that would allow for precision strike, making it effectively a match with a new fighter, the F-35, which effectively makes it into a strategic or long-range bomber instead of a short-range one, which, was, which is what's clear, which actually doesn't threaten Russia, but a long one does, and so on. So we have, and Russia now, in its, in its national security policy, calling the expansion of NATO out of, and its out-of-area operations the most significant external threat to its security, and therefore, they are modernizing their nuclear weapons, although they're only spending $70 billion over the next 10 years. And so we have to put, I think, I mean, this, we have to take this seriously. And we have to put the potential for a nuclear war between great powers with nuclear weapons 
at the center of our anti-war <laughs> advocacy. And what are these, what's this war going to be over? Resources. It's exactly what Bruce was talking about. It won't start out as a nuclear war, but competition between great powers with nuclear weapons over resources could escalate and turn into a nuclear exchange by accident or by design. Nobody talks about that. It's very real. Um, so in, in conclusion, I think, no, oh, that's my time, all right? I've never used the timer before, okay. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me conclude. Um, just two things. I think we, we, we use the expression speaking truth to power a lot in our movement. We need, I think, to add another dimension to that, which is speaking truth to each other, which is what I'm trying to model here today. We also, I think, have to tear ourselves <laughs> away from lobbying and electoral politics in this broken system like Pavlovian dogs as hard as it is, as painful as it is, it's not that we shouldn't or can't do any of that. A lot more of our effort, I think, needs to go into really building up a grassroots resistance, a grassroots voice that is asking clearly for what we want, what we demand, and what we need to survive, and not what we need to get the Senate to pass some lame treaty that's actually counterproductive. So, thank you. Thank you.